There are a lot of videos on the internet talking about the craft of the Dungeon Master. However, there's not a lot of conversation around her fundamental tool, the magic curtain that she uses to perform feats of prestidigitation, sleight of hand, to wow and inspire the players. And I'm talking about the moderator's screen, or depending on the lexicon of your particular game, the Dungeon Master's screen, the Storyteller's screen, the Game Master's screen. In this series, we're going to peek behind that magic curtain. We're going to dig inside of it. And I think you'll find with me, there's some surprises in store for all of us. I'm Rich Mayo, and this is Mach 1 Games. Many pursuits use a referee, sports mostly, American football, soccer, hockey, and there's a number of board games and other pursuits that don't really require a referee. Role-playing games don't really fit well into either camp because not only do you need a referee in a role-playing game, you also require an essential component. And it's this component, more than funny-sided dice or large tomes of rules, that make the essence of the role-playing experience. That is the Dungeon Master screen. Dungeon Master screen is certainly one of the most abused tools in the hobby. But it's also one of the most interesting. The word I'm going to use we can summarize the Dungeon Master screen or the moderator's screen in one word. That would be space. It creates a physical space, a point of separation between the moderator and the players. But it also creates space in which to create. Uh, Debussy said that music is the space between the notes. When you talk about design and uh, fine art, you look at the interplay of light and dark, the shape, the space, the negative space upon the page. And my nose is got really itchy. I have to do that again. I'm going to examine a series of... Uh, tips and tricks this series of videos is going to be more than just uh, some tips and tricks as to how to get the most out of the GM screen I want to also delve into the philosophy behind the screen now there's something I'm going to come back to over and over again and that's the concept of space. Debussy said that music is the space between the notes. In fine art and design, we take a look at the interplay of light and dark, the negative space and the positive space, and how it works to lead you through um, a piece to, to examine a problem. And you need space in the process to interact with the player on all three levels because the game doesn't just happen on the board in front of people it happens in their minds there's actually a second and a third world so if a role-playing game is a game of three worlds the dungeon master's screen or the moderator's screen 
is the portal by which that's possible. Because there's knowledge behind the screen and knowledge in front of the screen. And this gets to one of my first points. Too many GMs do not manage that space, that, that something is either behind the screen or it's in front of the screen, and they miss one of the essential elements of the screen, which are part of something is in front of the screen and part of something should be behind the screen. Uh, giving people 100% truth all the time as it plops in front of their screen is inartistic. It, uh, it misses the point. So I want to talk first about space. The space between the referee or moderator in a role-playing game and an American football counterpart is that the moderator holds on to some rules, some ideas, and shelters them from the players. Now, one of the mistakes is uh, for a game master or a moderator to hold either all of the information behind the screen or put all of the information in front of the screen. And both of those approaches are inartistic. Uh, the one is heavy-handed and controlling. Uh, the other is... Um, uh, is overly barren of artistry. The American football counterpart, that referee, has the rules of the game and is the arbiter of the calls. Whereas the moderator in a role-playing game allows for the space, provides a setting into which the creativity of the players can begin to shape and mold the world around them. And that the, the story genesis, the creation of the shared story is happening with everyone all together. So let's imagine a scenario. Let's imagine a scenario where an RPG referee is put in control of an NFL football game and the players march out onto the field. Well, slightly into the game, the referee calls a penalty for the players being in the near end zone and moves the ball back 20 yards. And all the players and fans are suitably confused. By the end of the first half, this RPG referee has made three or four other calls which are completely incomprehensible to the players and the fans. Well, when the players take the field for the second half and the referee calls a penalty from the beginning, to the delight of the fans, the players will now dismember the referee. And what we're going to see is that could have gone an awful lot better, which leads into my first point, preparation and precursor. We can take the same scenario, the same strange set of rules, and create trust. Preparation creates trust. What that means is that if the field on which they began to play was painted so that the 10 yards before the goal line had skulls and crossbones, that there were strange symbols at other parts of the field that showed spinning or other prohibitions, then the players are more apt to trust in the decisions of the referee. If you want your players to trust you, do the work. Preparation implies consistency. So the first thing that you must do as a GM is give players something to 
bite into, something to latch onto. If you make an entire martial arts system, give the players a sweaty glove. If you make a civilization, give them a clay pot. Give them clues to the work that you're doing. Because like an iceberg, they recognize that 90% of what you do is going to be beneath the surface. So if you've given them nothing in front of the screen, they expect nothing from behind the screen. Or if you're that person, I alluded to it earlier, that tries to put ever, all your work in front of the players. I draw this perfect map and I put it in front of the screen. Then I begin to suspect that I'm seeing everything and that what's behind the screen is vacant. Don't give them a whole finished map. Give them part of the map. Then they know, they trust, that on this side of the screen there exists a more complete map. And you're now creating the right interplay between player and moderator. Space is important for creativity. Negative and positive space frames that experience. So my first rule, suggestion, observation about the nature of the screen is that you must be aware of your preparation and then make sure you're mirroring it in front of the screen. Don't hold it all back. Don't put it all forward. Use your preparation to help frame. Simplify. Simplify, simplify, simplify. When you create the world, you're not making the set of stories that are going to play out at the table. Why, one of the reasons why in Beyond the Role-Playing Game, I talk about the game moderator is not because you're a facilitator at a business meeting. It's because you're going to move things into the middle. It is in the middle world, in the middle kingdoms, which your game will take place. That's the world of the players, the story that they've come to tell. Your material is in the background. Leave it in the background. Simplify. Make it tangible to the players in such a way that it doesn't seem obscure. There can be lots of complicated things going on. But simplify, simplify your material. Along with that, and sort of a tangent of this, is to dismantle your material. And what I mean by that is many people like to create a story. One of the reasons why you are a moderator is you like to make up worlds and make up stories and have the players uh, in, encounter it. But it's a big mistake to have the entire story told to them from front to back in perfect detail in perfect perspective, that's not how worlds work. You don't have one faithful narrator who is going to tell you everything that is true. You need to dismantle your material and tell it through the eyes of a victim. Tell it through the eyes of a widow. Tell it through the eyes of a mother. They don't have the whole story. They don't have an unbiased story. They have your material told from their point of view, which is simple, it's easy to understand, and it's a hook. It's something that the players can choose to latch on to, to offer perspective, and to examine their material. Now, next point. Let the players pick the villains. 
Now, I'm not saying that your campaign world shouldn't have a diabolical mustache twirling, um, insane creature who seeks to destroy the world. Um, but after playing Princes of the Apocalypse, Giants of the Apocalypse, uh, uh, Descent into the Mountains of the Apocalypse, uh, Out of the Abyss Comes the Apocalypse, The Horde of the Dragon Apocalypse, uh, at some point, you might engage in a story that's not about the end of the world and is more grounded in what the players are interested in and where they're going. And in such a schema, you're just trying to create characters who may be in conflict with the players, but you're not making villains. The players make the villains. It's an important distinction but it allows them to respond viscerally to the people that you put out. Make them interesting enough so that they have things that they can like and dislike, but let the players choose the villains of the campaign. Blank hooks. The enemy of the moderator is in action. It is players and characters who take a passive role in the events that are unfolding, who, through lack of understanding, lack of interest, lack of control, do not feel like they have a point to insert themselves into the campaign, which is why you want to include blank hooks. You're going to include your real hook as well, your story threads that you want them to pick up on. But you must also include throwaway information, information that is peculiar, anything that piques their interest. Three people in the town that they're visiting all have the same similar scar on their right arm, uh, a scar that they all hide and won't talk about. You don't need to know what that means. All you need to do is give them that piece of information. Now, you don't want to tie this to the plot because you don't want them spinning their wheels around. But you want to throw enough spice into the soup that eventually you can come back to that and let the players discover a solution for that with you. And then your preparation, the space that you've left behind, now starts to take fruition. You appear uh, a lot smarter, a lot better planned than you were. Uh, they detect a, a sense of evil and foreboding coming from a horseshoe. What does that mean? It doesn't need to mean anything in the moment. All it means is it gives you permission as the moderator to include things in your story and take good note of them when you do that are going to pay off down the road. Now, you don't want to recreate a Battlestar Galactica where they don't know any of the mysteries. You need to know the mysteries that are core to you, uh, core to the plots that you're developing, but you can continue to chum the waters with lots of interesting opportunities and where it takes the players, where it, where they go with it, it gives them threads to latch onto. And it's one of the biggest problems most people have with the art of being a moderator is that either they're telling a story and saying they're moving from set piece to set piece to set piece and expecting the players to come along for the ride. And there can be a certain amount of that, but there needs to be a, um, a, a, enough interest in the story of the game, the story of the players, not your people. Your people are the background, the intersections, the problems. And so what those blank hooks do is they give the players an easy thread to pick up. It's daunting if, if you have big, earth-shattering uh, 
decisions to make all the time, players are afraid of making bad choices. Oh, I don't want to touch that. That seems really, really dangerous. Well, that's a problem that most moderators are creating themselves. Oh, the players don't want to touch things because they get a they get punished for touching things all the time. And eventually it creates an inaction in them and uh, it, it creates a dynamic that's not helpful for creativity. You want to get out of that. You want to break that cycle. You give them things to make choices. And then when they start making the big choices, they don't know whether they're making a big choice or a little choice. They're just in the habit of making choices. 70% of your character's choices should work out towards some kind of fun thing. If Make sure you're not bashing your players on the head for every choice that they make. Because uh, then they stop making them and then your game is, is dead in the water. So, leave space. When I was young, I had a passion for maps. Says Marlow in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. He says, I would look at a blank space on the map and I would point at it. It says, when I am older, I will go here. Well, Heart of Darkness is an interesting novel because it's generally considered to be the first novel of the 20th century, even though it was written in the late 1800s, so a few years before the 1900s, which is when the 20th century begins. But it's considered a modern novel because it has a flawed narrator and an embedded narrative. And it doesn't lend itself to a simple conclusion. And it exists on many levels. And this is the whole thing I've been talking about with role-playing games. Well, it sort of sits on both levels. The horror, the horror and the My Beloved. And if you're aware of what I'm talking about, you've read the novel, that you're going to see how I'm talking about the scales of those two sentences. Uh, uh, the last words of Kurtz. The last words were the horror, the horror, according to the one narrator, and was your name was the other. So you have these two different answers. So, in a role-playing game where we have a screen and we're setting up our different types of um, our players and the different events that are happening, we don't have to come to firm conclusions about everything. We can have characters who go, I don't know if this person is a villain. I just know I have to oppose them. Those things are far more interesting, far more valuable in the interplay in the game. Now, the last thing for this video, and I've got a whole whack of other things to talk about um, when it comes to the moderator screen, but the last little nugget, so to speak, in this series, in this video, and uh, I originally wrote this as a, uh, as an article, so. I've got a whole series of other little uh, words of wisdom. The last one is link your treasure. Sometimes the tendency is for uh, a new moderator uh, and somebody who's new to being the game master is to give treasure as a reward as a throwaway at the end of the adventure, especially if you're playing a game that's uh, highly math-centric where, where combat you know, fills up all your brain. And then at the end of it, it's like, oh, you guys have won. Here's some treasure. You get too excited. Um, players aren't particularly excited about getting super magic treasure. Um, but link your treasure. It's not a reward. Treasure should be a hook to another thing. It's more interesting in your treasure to give a, a key than a chest with gold. It's more interesting to give uh, a note 
that has something in it that refers to the next place, the next location, that helps unravel a mystery, that hooks people in and drives the story forward. So reward the players with people, with places. Not, you can with things as well, but with clues and ideas and abilities. A hint, a reference to, you know, oh, we've just fought this, 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 uh, this, this villain, villain who opposed us. And I see a note from a master where he learned perhaps some of the things that he did that I didn't think people could do, right? That, that there is a hook, there is an interest, and it drives the players deeper into the world that you've created. So I'd like to thank you for watching. I'd like to invite you to join the YouTube channel or join the Facebook page. Uh, log on to the website, take a look around. Uh, I'm going to be producing a number of videos that are just role-playing general, in general tips uh, and tricks and ideas for people. And I'm going to be doing some that are specific on uh, the role-playing game that we will be releasing uh, later this year, early next year, called Beyond the Role-Playing Game, which gives you some tools to actually help manage some of this stuff. Um, but again, if you're just interested in role-playing games in, in general, hopefully this can add something to your discussion. So uh, please click on a like, watch some of the other videos, and I'm going to be trying to do things of uh, a different tone and different notes. I'm going to have a couple rants, I'm going to have some of these more academic things, and we'll see what people um, pick up and, and resonate with. Uh, let me know. Uh, I can kind of come off as a bit professory uh, at times, and uh, uh, I just want to see what people are, are interested in, uh, in talking about or or reacting to any of them, please talk about it. Give me some feedback in the comments and let me know. Other than that, please stay safe out there and I'll see you next video. Thanks for watching.